Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens. Book One, The Cup and the Lip. Chapter Nine, Mr. and Mrs. Boffin in Consultation. Betaking himself straight homeward, Mr. Boffin, without further let or hindrance, arrived at the bower, and gave Mrs. Boffin, in a walking dress of black velvet and feathers, like a morning coach horse, an account of all he had said and done since breakfast. This brings us round, my dear, he then pursued, to the question we left unfinished, namely, whether there's to be any new go-in for fashion. Now, I'll tell you what I want, Noddy, said Mrs. Boffin, smoothing her dress with an air of immense enjoyment. I want society. Fashionable society, my dear. Yes, cried Mrs. Boffin, laughing with the glee of a child. Yes, it's no good my being kept here like waxwork, is it now? People have to pay to see waxwork, my dear returned her husband, whereas, though you'd be cheap at the same money, the neighbours is wanting to see you for nothing. But it don't answer, said the cheerful Mrs. Boffin. When we worked like the neighbours, we suited one another. Now we have left work off. We have left off suiting one another. What do you think of beginning work again? Mr. Boffin hinted. Out of the question. We have come into a great fortune, and we must do what's right by our fortune. We must act up to it. Mr. Boffin, who had a deep respect for his wife's intuitive wisdom, replied, though rather pensively, I suppose we must. It's never been acted up to yet, and consequently. No good has come of it, said Mrs. Boffin. Uh, true, to the present time, Mr. Boffin assented with his former pensiveness as he took his seat upon his settle. I hope good may be coming of it in the future time. Towards which, what's your views, old lady? Mrs. Boffin, a smiling creature, broad of figure and simple of nature, with her hands folded in her lap and with buxom creases in her throat, proceeded to expound her views. "'I say, a good house, in a good neighbourhood, good things about us, good living, and good society. I say, live like our means, without extravagance, and be happy.' "'Yes, I say be happy too,' assented the still pensive Mr. Boffin. "'Lord of mercy!' exclaimed Mrs. Boffin, laughing and clapping her hands, and gaily rocking herself to and fro, "'When I think of me, in a light yellow chariot and pair, with silver boxes to the wheels—' "'Oh, you were thinking of that, was you, my dear?' "'Yes,' cried the delighted creature, "'and with a footman up behind, with a bar across, to keep his legs from being pulled, and with a Coachman up in front, sinking down into a seat, big enough for three of him, all covered with upholstery in green and white, and with two bay horses tossing their heads and stepping higher than they trot long ways, and with you and me leaning back inside, as grand as ninepence. Oh, my! <laughs> Mrs. Boffin clapped her hands again rocked herself again, beat her feet upon the floor, and wiped the tears of laughter from her eyes. "'And what, my old lady?' inquired Mr. Boffin, when he also had sympathetically laughed. "'What's your views on the subject of the bower?' "'Shut it up. Don't part with it, but put somebody in it to keep it.' "'Any other views?' "'Noddy!' said Mrs. Boffin, coming from her fashionable sofa to his side on the plain settle, and hooking her comfortable arm through his. "'Next, I think, and I really have been thinking early and late, of the disappointed girl. Her that was so cruelly disappointed, you know, both of her husband and his riches. Don't you think we might do something for her?' 
have her t to live with us, or, or, or something of that sort? Never once thought of the way of doing it, cried Mr. Boffin, smiting the table in his admiration. What a thinking steam engine this old lady is! And she don't know how she does it. Neither does the engine. Mrs. Boffin pulled his nearest ear in acknowledgment of this piece of philosophy, and then said, gradually toning down to a motherly strain, "'Last, and not least, I've taken a fancy. You remember dear little John Harmon, before he went to school, over yonder across the yard at our fire? Now that he's passed all benefit of the money, and it's come to us, I should like to find some orphan child, and take the boy, and adopt him, and give him John's name, and provide for him. Somehow it would make me easier, I fancy. Say it, it's only a whim. But I don't say so, interposed her husband. No, but, but dearie, if you did— I should be a beast if I did, her husband interposed again. That's as much as to say you agree. Oh, good and kind of you, and like you, dearie. "'And don't you begin to find it pleasant now?' said Mrs. Boffin, once more radiant in her comely way from head to foot, and once more smoothing her dress with immense enjoyment. "'Don't you begin to find it pleasant already? To think that a child will be made brighter and better and happier because of that poor sad child that day? And isn't it pleasant to know that the good will be done with the poor sad child's own money?' "'Yes, and it's pleasant to know that you are Mrs. Boffin,' said her husband. "'And it's been a pleasant thing to know this many and many a year.' It was ruin to Mrs. Boffin's aspirations, but, having so spoken, they sat side by side, a hopelessly unfashionable pair. These two ignorant and unpolished people had guided themselves so far on in their journey of life, by a religious sense of duty, and desire to do right. Ten thousand weaknesses and absurdities might have been detected in the breasts of both, ten thousand vanities additional, possibly, in the breast of the woman. But the hard, wrathful, and sordid nature, that had wrung as much work out of them as could be got in their best days, for as little money as could be paid to hurry on their worst, had never been so warped, but that it knew their moral straightness, and respected it. In its own despite, in a constant conflict with itself and them, it had done so. And this is the eternal law, for evil often stops short at itself, and dies with the doer of it, but good never. Through his most inveterate purposes, the dead jailer of Harmony Jail had known these two faithful servants to be honest and true. While he raged at them, and reviled them for opposing him with the speech of the honest and true, it had scratched his stony heart, and he had perceived the powerlessness of all his wealth to buy them if he had addressed himself to the attempt. So, even while he was their griping taskmaster, and never gave them a good word, he had written their names down in his will. So, even while it was his daily declaration that he mistrusted all mankind, and sorely indeed he did mistrust all who bore any resemblance to himself, he was as certain that these two people, surviving him, would be trustworthy in all things, from the greatest to the least, as he was, that he must surely die. Mr. and Mrs. Boffin, sitting side by side, with fashion withdrawn to an immeasurable distance, fell to discussing how they could best find their orphan. Mrs. Boffin suggested advertisement in the newspapers, requesting orphans answering a next description to apply at the bower on a certain day but Mr. Boffin, wisely apprehending obstruction of the neighbouring thoroughfares by orphan swarms, this cause was negatived. Mrs. Boffin next suggested application to their clergyman for a likely orphan. Mr. Boffin, thinking better of this scheme, they resolved to call upon the reverend gentleman at once, and to take the same opportunity of making acquaintance with Miss Bella Wilfer. In order that these visits might be visits of state, Mrs. Boffin's equipage was ordered out. This consisted of a long hammer-headed old horse, formerly used in the business, attached to a four-wheeled chaise of the same period, which had long been exclusively used by the Harmony Jail poultry as the favourite laying-place of several discreet hens. 
an unwonted application of corn to the horse, and of paint and varnish to the carriage, when both fell in as a part of the Boffin legacy, had made what Mr. Boffin considered a neat turn-out of the whole, and a driver being added, in the person of a long hammer-headed young man, who was a very good match for the horse, left nothing to be desired. He, too, had been formerly used in the business, but was now entombed by an honest jobbing tailor of the district, in a perfect sepulchre of coat and gaiters sealed with ponderous buttons. Behind this domestic, Mr. and Mrs. Boffin took their seats in the back compartment of the vehicle, which was sufficiently commodious, but had an undignified and alarming tendency, in getting over a rough crossing, to hiccup itself away from the front compartment. On their being descried, emerging from the gates of the bower, the neighbourhood turned out a door and window to salute the Boffins. Among those who were ever and again left behind, staring after the equipage, were many youthful spirits, who hailed in it stentorian tones with such congratulations as, Nod de ba fin Boffin's money, down with the dust, Boffin, and other similar compliments. These the hammer-headed young man took in such ill part, that he often impaired the majesty of the progress by pulling up short, and making as though he would alight to exterminate the offenders, a purpose from which he only allowed himself to be dissuaded after long and lively arguments with his employers. At length the Bower district was left behind and the peaceful dwelling of the Reverend Frank Milvey was gained. The Reverend Frank Milvey's abode was a very modest abode, because his income was a very modest income. He was officially accessible to every blundering old woman who had incoherence to bestow upon him, and readily received the boffins. He was quite a young man, expensively educated and wretchedly paid, with quite a young wife and half a dozen quite young children. He was under the necessity of teaching and translating from the classics, to eke out his scanty means, yet was generally expected to have more time to spare than the idlest person in the parish, and more money than the richest. He accepted the needless inequalities and inconsistencies of his life, with a kind of conventional submission that was almost slavish, and any daring layman who would have adjusted such burdens as his more decently and graciously would have had small help from him. With a ready, patient face and manner, and yet with a latent smile that showed a quick enough observation of Mrs. Boffin's dress, Mr. Milvey, in his little book-room, charged with sounds and cries as though the six children above were coming down through the ceiling, and the roasting leg of mutton below were coming up through the floor, listened to Mrs. Boffin's statement of her want of an orphan. "'I think,' said Mr. Milvey, "'that uh, you have never had uh, a child of your own, Mr. and Mrs. Boffin?' "'Never.' "'But, uh, like the kings and queens in the fairy tales, I suppose you have a wished uh, for one?' "'In a, a general way, yes.' Mr. Milvey smiled again, as he remarked to himself, "'Those kings and queens uh, were always wishing for children it occurring to him, perhaps, that if they had been curates, their wishes might have tended in the opposite direction. "'I think,' he pursued, "'we had uh, better take Mrs. Milvey into our council. She is indispensable to me. If you please, I'll call her.' So Mr. Milvey called, "'Margaretta, my dear,' and Mrs. Milvey came down a pretty, bright little woman, something worn by anxiety, who had repressed many pretty tastes and bright fancies, and substituted in their stead schools, soup, flannel, coals, and all the weekday cares and Sunday coughs of a large population, young and old. As gallantly had Mr. Milvey repressed much in himself that naturally belonged to his old studies and old fellow-students, and taken up among the poor and their children with the hard crumbs of life. "'Mr. and Mrs. Boffin, my dear, whose good uh, fortune you have heard of.' Mrs. Milvey, with the most unaffected grace in the world, congratulated them, and was glad to see them. Yet her engaging face, being an open as well as a perceptive one, was not without her husband's latent smile. "'Mrs. Uh, Boffin wishes to adopt uh, a little boy, my dear.' Mrs. Milvey looked rather alarmed. Her husband added, 
an orphan, my dear?' 'Oh!' said Mrs. Milvey, reassured for her own little boys. 'And uh, I was uh, thinking, uh, Margaretta, that uh, perhaps old Mrs. Goody's grandchild uh, might answer the purpose.' "'Oh, my dear Frank, I don't think that would do. No? Oh, no!' The smiling Mrs. Boffin, feeling it incumbent on her to take part in the conversation, and being charmed with the emphatic little wife and her ready interest, here offered her acknowledgments, and inquired what there was against him. "'I don't think,' said Mrs. Milvey, glancing at the Reverend Frank, "'and I believe my husband will agree with me, when he considers it again, that you could possibly keep that orphan clean from snuff, because his grandmother takes so many ounces and drops it over him.' "'But he would not be living with his grandmother then, Margaretta,' said Mr. Milvey. "'No, Frank, but it would be impossible to keep her from Mrs. Boffin's house, and the more there was to eat and drink there, the oftener she would go. And she is an inconvenient woman. I hope it's not uncharitable to remember that last Christmas Eve she drank eleven cups of tea, and grumbled all the time, and she is not a grateful woman, Frank. You recollect her addressing a crowd outside this house about her wrongs, when, one night, after he had gone to bed, she brought back the petticoat of a new flannel that had been given her, because it was too short. "'That's true,' said Mr. Milvey. "'I don't uh, think that would do. "'Would uh, little Harrison—' "'Oh, Frank,' remonstrated his emphatic wife, "'he has no grandmother, my dear.' "'No, but I don't think Mrs. Boffin would like an orphan who squints so much.' "'That's true again,' said Mr. Milvey, becoming haggard with perplexity. "'If uh, a little girl would do.' "'But, my dear Frank, Mrs. Boffin wants a boy.' "'That's true again,' said Mr. Milvey. "'Tom Bocker is a nice boy,' thoughtfully. "'But I doubt, Frank,' Mrs. Milvey hinted, after a little hesitation, "'if Mrs. Boffin wants an orphan quite nineteen, who drives a cart and waters the roads.' Mr. Milvey referred the point to Mrs. Boffin in a look. On that smiling lady shaking her black velvet bonnet and bows, he remarked in lower spirits, "'That's uh, true again.' "'I am sure,' said Mrs. Boffin, concerned at giving so much trouble, "'that if I had known you would have taken so much pain, sir, and you too, ma'am, I don't think I would have come.' "'Pray, don't say that,' urged Mrs. Milvey. "'No, don't say that.' assented Mr. Milvey, because we are so much obliged to you for giving us the preference, which Mrs. Milvey confirmed, and really the kind, conscientious couple spoke as if they kept some profitable orphan warehouse, and were personally patronised. But it is a responsible trust, added Mr. Milvey, and difficult to discharge. At the same time, we are naturally very unwilling uh, to lose the chance you so kindly give us, and if you could afford us a day or two to look uh, about us, you know, Margaretta, we might carefully examine the workhouse, and the infant uh, school, and your district. To be sure, said the emphatic little wife. We have orphans, I know pursued Mr. Milvey, quite with the air, as if he might have added in stock, and quite as anxiously as if there were great competition in the business, and he were afraid of losing an order. 
over at the uh, clay pits but they are employed uh, by relations or friends and i am afraid it would come uh, at last to a transaction in the way of uh, barter and even if you exchanged uh, blankets for the child or books and uh, firing it would be impossible to prevent their being turned into liquor accordingly it was resolved that mr and mrs milvey should search for an orphan likely to suit and as free as possible from the foregoing objections and should communicate again with mrs boffin then mr boffin took the liberty of mentioning to mr milvey that if mr milvey would do him the kindness to be perpetually his banker to the extent of a twenty pound note or so to be expended without any reference to him he would be heartily obliged at this both mr milvey and mrs milvey were quite as much pleased as if they had no wants of their own but only knew what poverty was in the persons of other people and so the interview terminated with satisfaction and good opinion on all sides now old lady said mr boffin as they resumed their seats behind the hammer-headed horse and man having made a very agreeable visit there we'll try wilfers it appeared on their drawing up at the family gate that to try wilfers was a thing more easily projected than done on account of the extreme difficulty of getting into that establishment three pulls at the bell producing no external result, though each was attended by audible sounds of scampering and rushing within. At the fourth tug, vindictively administered by the hammer-headed young man, Miss Lavinia appeared, emerging from the house in an accidental manner, with a bonnet and parasol, as designing to take a contemplative walk. The young lady was astonished to find visitors at the gate, and expressed her feelings in appropriate action. "'Here's Mr. and Mrs. Boffin,' growled the hammer-headed young man through the bars of the gate, and at the same time shaking it, as if he were on view in a menagerie. "'They've been here half an hour.' "'Who did you say?' asked Miss Lavinia. "'Mr. and Mrs. Boffin,' returned the young man, rising into a roar. Miss Lavinia tripped up the steps to the house-door, tripped down the steps with the key, tripped across the little garden, and opened the gate. "'Please to walk in,' said Miss Lavinia haughtily. "'Our servant is out.' Mr. and Mrs. Boffin complying, and pausing in the little hall until Miss Lavinia came up to show them where to go next, perceived three pairs of listening legs upon the stairs above. Mrs. Wilfer's legs, Miss Bella's legs, Mr. George Sampson's legs. "'Mr. and Mrs. Boffin, I think,' said Lavinia, in a warning voice, strained attention on the part of Mrs. Wilfer's legs, of Miss Bella's legs, of Mr. George Sampson's legs. "'Yes, miss. "'If you step this way, down these stairs I'll let Ma know.' Excited flight of Mrs. Wilfer's legs, of Miss Bella's legs, of Mr. George Sampson's legs. After waiting some quarter of an hour alone in the family sitting-room, which presented traces of having been so hastily arranged after a meal, that one might have doubted whether it was made tidy for visitors, or cleared for blind man's buff, Mr. and Mrs. Boffin became aware of the entrance of Mrs. Wilfer, majestically faint, and with a condescending stitch in her side, which was her company manner. "'Pardon me,' said Mrs. Wilfer after the first salutations, and as soon as she had adjusted the handkerchief under her chin, and waved her gloved hands. "'To what am I indebted for this honour? "'To make short of it, ma'am,' returned Mr. Boffin, "'perhaps you may be acquainted with the names of me and Mrs. Boffin, as having come into a certain property.' "'I have heard, sir,' returned Mrs. Wilfer, with a dignified bend of her head, "'of such being the case.' "'And, I dare say, ma'am,' pursued Mr. Boffin, while Mrs. Boffin added confirmatory nods and smiles, "'you are not very much inclined to take kindly to us.' "'Pardon me,' said Mrs. Wilfer, "'twere unjust to visit upon Mr. and Mrs. Boffin a calamity which was doubtless a dispensation.' These words were rendered the more effective by a serenely heroic expression of suffering. "'That's fairly meant, I'm sure,' remarked the honest Mr. Boffin. Mrs. Boffin and me, ma'am, are plain people, and we don't want to pretend to anything, nor yet to go round and round anything 
because there's always a straight way to everything. Consequently, we make this call to say that we shall be glad to have the honour and pleasure of your daughter's acquaintance, and that we shall be rejoiced if your daughter will come to consider our house in the light of her home, equally with this. In short, we want to cheer your daughter, and to give her the opportunity of sharing such pleasures as we are going to take ourselves. We want to brisk her up, and brisk her about, and give her a change. "'That's it,' said the open-hearted Mrs. Boffin. "'Law! <laughs> Let's be comfortable!' Mrs. Wilfer bent her head in a distant manner to her lady visitor, and, with majestic monotony, replied to the gentleman, "'Pardon me. I have several daughters. Which of my daughters am I to understand is thus favoured by the kind intentions of Mr. Boffin and his lady?' <laughs> "'Don't you see?' the ever-smiling Mrs. Boffin put in. "'Naturally, Miss Bella, you know?' "'Oh,' said Mrs. Wilfer, with a severely unconvinced look. "'My daughter, Bella, is accessible, and shall speak for herself.' Then, opening the door a little way, simultaneously with the sound of scuttling outside it, the good lady made the proclamation, "'Send Miss Bella to me!' which proclamation, though grandly formal, and one might almost say heraldic, to hear, was in fact enunciated with her maternal eyes reproachfully glaring on that young lady in the flesh, and in so much of it that she was retiring with difficulty into the small closet under the stairs, apprehensive of the emergence of Mr. and Mrs. Boffin. "'The advocations of R. W., my husband,' Mrs. Wilfer explained, on resuming her seat, Keep him fully engaged in the city at this time of the day, or he would have had the honour of participating in your reception beneath our humble roof. Very pleasant premises, said Mr. Boffin cheerfully. Pardon me, sir, returned Mrs. Wilfer, correcting him. It is the abode of conscious, though independent, poverty. Finding it rather difficult to pursue the conversation down this road, Mr. and Mrs. Boffin sat staring at mid-air, and Mrs. Wilfer sat silently giving them to understand that every breath she drew required to be drawn with a self-denial rarely paralleled in history, until Miss Bella appeared, whom Mrs. Wilfer presented, and to whom she explained the purpose of the visitors. "'I am much obliged to you, I am sure,' said Miss Bella, coldly shaking her curls, "'but I doubt if I have the inclination to go out at all.' "'Bella,' Mrs. Wilfer admonished her, "'Bella, you must conquer this.' "'Yes, do what your ma says, and conquer it, my dear,' urged Mrs. Boffin, "'because we shall be so glad to have you, and because you are much too pretty to keep yourself shut up.' With that the pleasant creature gave her a kiss, and patted her on her dimpled shoulders. Mrs. Wilfer, sitting stiffly by, like a functionary presiding over an interview previous to an execution. "'We are going to move into a nice house,' said Mrs. Boffin, who was woman enough to compromise Mr. Boffin on that point, when he couldn't very well contest it. "'And we are going to set up a nice carriage, and we'll go everywhere, and see everything. And you mustn't—' seating Bella beside her and patting her hand. "'You mustn't feel a dislike to us to begin with, because we couldn't help it, you know, my dear.' With the natural tendency of youth to yield to candour and sweet temper, Miss Bella was so touched by the simplicity of this address that she frankly returned Mrs. Boffin's kiss. Not at all to the satisfaction of that good woman of the world, her mother, who sought to hold the advantageous ground of obliging the Boffins instead of being obliged. "'My youngest daughter, Lavinia,' said Mrs. Wilfer, glad to make a diversion, as that young lady appeared. "'Mr. George Sampson, a friend of the family.' The friend of the family was in that state of tender passion which bound him to regard everybody else as the foe of the family. He put the round head of his cane in his mouth like a stopper when he sat down, as if he felt himself full to the throat with affronting sentiments, and he eyed the boffins with implacable eyes. "'If you like to bring your sister with you when you come to stay with us,' said Mrs. Boffin, "'of course we shall be glad. The better you please yourself, Miss Bella, the better you please us.' "'Oh, my consent is of no consequence at all, I suppose,' 
cried Miss Lavinia. Laffy, said her sister in a low voice, have the goodness to be seen and not heard. No, I won't, replied the sharp Lavinia. I'm not a child to be taken notice of by strangers. You are a child. I'm not a child, and I won't be taken notice of. Bring your sister, indeed. Lavinia, said Mrs. Wilfer, hold. I will not allow you to utter in my presence the absurd suspicion that any strangers, I care not what their names, can patronise my child. Do you dare to suppose, you ridiculous girl, that Mr. and Mrs. Boffin would enter those doors upon a patronising errand, or if they did, would remain within them only for one single instant, while your mother had the strength yet remaining in her vital frame to request them to depart? You little know your mother if you presume to think so. It's all very fine. Lavinia began to grumble, and Mrs. Wilfer repeated, "'Hold! I will not allow this. Do you not know what is due to guests? Do you not comprehend that in presuming to hint that this lady and gentleman could have any idea of patronising any member of your family, I care not which you accuse them of an impertinence little less than insane?' "'Never mind me and Mrs. Boffin, ma'am,' said Mr. Boffin, smilingly. "'We don't care. Pardon me, but I do.' returned Mrs. Wilfer. Miss Lavinia laughed, a short laugh, as she muttered, "'Yes, to be sure. "'And I require my audacious child,' proceeded Mrs. Wilfer, with a withering look at her youngest, on whom it had not the slightest effect, "'to please to be just to her sister Bella, to remember that her sister Bella is much sought after, and that when her sister Bella accepts an intention, she considers herself to be conferring quite as much honour, this with an indignant shiver, as she receives. But here Miss Bella repudiated, and said quietly, I can speak for myself, you know, Ma. You needn't bring me in, please. And it's all very well aiming at others through convenient me, said the irrepressible Lavinia spitefully, but I should like to ask George Sampson what he says to it. Mr. Sampson, proclaimed Mrs. Wilver, seeing that young gentleman take his stopper out, and so darkly fixing him with her eyes as that he put it in again. Mr. Sampson, as a friend of this family and a frequenter of this house, is, I am persuaded, far too well bred to interpose on such an invitation. This exultation of the young gentleman moved the conscientious Mrs. Boffin to repentance for having done him an injustice in her mind, and consequently to saying that she and Mr. Boffin would at any time be glad to see him, an attention which he handsomely acknowledged by replying with his stopper unremoved, "'Much obliged to you, but I always engaged day and night.' However, Bella compensating for all drawbacks by responding to the advances of the Boffins in an engaging way, that easy pair were on the whole well satisfied, and proposed to the said Bella that as soon as they should be in a condition to receive her in a manner suitable to their desires, Mrs. Boffin should return with notice of the fact. This arrangement Mrs. Wilfer sanctioned with a stately inclination of her head and wave of her gloves, as who should say, Your demerits shall be overlooked, and you shall be mercifully gratified, poor people. "'By the by, ma'am,' said Mr. Boffin, turning back as he was going, "'you have a lodger.' "'A gentleman,' Mrs. Wilfer answered, qualifying the lower expression, "'undoubtedly occupies our first floor.' "'I may call him our mutual friend,' said Mr. Boffin. "'What sort of a fellow is our mutual friend now? Do you like him?' "'Mr. Oaksmith is very punctual, very quiet, a very eligible inmate.' because mr boffin explained you must know that i'm not particularly well acquainted with our mutual friend for i've only seen him once you give a good account of him is he at home mr rokesmith is at home said mrs wilfer indeed pointing through the window there he stands at the garden gate waiting for you perhaps perhaps so replied mr boffin saw me come in maybe Bella had closely attended to this short dialogue. Accompanying Mrs. Boffin to the gate, she as closely watched what followed. "'How are you, sir? How are you?' said Mr. Boffin. "'This is Mrs. Boffin. Mr. Rokesmith, I told you of, my dear.' She gave him good day, 
and he bestirred himself, and helped her to her seat, and the like, with a ready hand. "'Good-bye for the present, Miss Bella,' said Mrs. Boffin, calling out a hearty parting. "'We shall meet again soon, and then I hope I shall have my little John Harmon to show you.' Mr. Rokesmith, who was at the wheel adjusting the skirts of her dress, suddenly looked behind him and around him, and then looked up at her, with a face so pale, that Mrs. Boffin cried, "'Gracious!' and after a moment, "'What's the matter, sir?' "'How can you show her the dead?' returned Mr. Rokesmith. "'It's only an adopted child, one I have told her of, one I'm going to give the name to.' "'You took me by surprise,' said Mr. Rokesmith, "'and it sounded like an omen that you should speak of showing the dead to one so young and blooming.' Now, Bella suspected by this time that Mr. Rokesmith admired her. Whether the knowledge, for it was rather that than suspicion, caused her to incline to him a little more, or a little less, than she had done at first. Whether it rendered her eager to find out more about him, because she sought to establish reason for her distrust, or because she sought to free him from it, was as yet dark to her own heart. But at most times he occupied a great amount of her attention and she had set her attention closely on this incident. That he knew it as well as she, she knew as well as he, when they were left together, standing on the path by the garden gate. "'Those are worthy people, Miss Wilfer.' "'Do you know them well?' asked Bella. He smiled, reproaching her, and she coloured, reproaching herself, both with the knowledge that she had meant to entrap him into an answer not true, when he said, "'I know of them.' "'Truly, he told us he had seen you but once.' "'Truly, I supposed he did.' Bella was nervous now, and would have been glad to recall her question. "'You thought it strange that, feeling much interested in you, I should start at what sounded like a proposal to bring you into contact with the murdered man who lies in his grave. I might have known—' of course in a moment should have known, that it could not have that meaning. But my interest remains. Re-entering the family room in a meditative state, Miss Bella was received by the irrepressible Lavinia with, "'There, Bella! At last I hope you've got your wishes realised by your boffins. You'll be rich enough now with your boffins. You can have as much flirting as you like at your boffins.' "'But you won't take me to your boffins. "'I can tell you, you and your boffins, too.' "'If,' quoth Mr. George Sampson, moodily pulling his stopper out, "'Miss Bella's Mr. Boffin comes any more of his nonsense to me. "'I only wish him to understand, as betwixt man and man, "'that he does it at his peril. "'And was going to say peril. But Miss Lavinia, having no confidence in his mental powers, and feeling his oration to have no definite application to any circumstances, jerked his stopper in again, with a sharpness that made his eyes water. And now the worthy Mrs. Wilfer, having used her youngest daughter as a lay figure for the edification of these boffins, became bland to her, and proceeded to develop her last instance of force of character, which was still in reserve. This was— to illuminate the family with her remarkable powers as a physiognomist, powers that terrified R. W. whenever let loose, as being always fraught with gloom and evil which no inferior prescience was aware of. And this Mrs. Wilfer now did, be it observed, in jealousy of these boffins, in the very same moments when she was already reflecting how she would flourish these very same boffins and the state they kept over the heads of her boffinless friends. "'Of their manners,' said Mrs. Wilfer, "'I say nothing. Of their appearance, I say nothing. Of the disinterestedness of their intentions towards Bella, I say nothing. But the craft, the secrecy, the dark, deep, underhanded plotting, written in Mrs. Boffin's countenance, make me shudder.' As an incontrovertible proof that those baleful attributes were all there, Mrs. Wilfer shuddered on the spot. End of Book One, Chapter Nine